Hi, this is Ms. Delosier, and these are your notes on genetic drift. So, the first thing we need to do is we need to define what genetic drift is. Genetic drift is just a change in the frequencies of an allele in a population that's due to random sampling. Um, and what I mean by random sampling is we're going to have a, too small of a sample size, so we're going to randomly not get the appropriate allele frequencies. So um, this is typically uh, P and Q are going to differ between the parental um, generation and the subsequent generations, and that's going to be due normally to a small population size um, or a small number of offspring. But it it doesn't always have to be, but almost always. So um, think about it this way: if you flip a coin. 20 times, you expect to get 10 heads and 10 tails, but you're probably not really going to get 10 heads and 10 tails every time you do that. If you flip a coin a million times, you're going to be a lot closer to 50% heads and 50% tails, just because you're going to have a larger sample size. Um, it's kind of the same logic behind why I tell you you need to have like 20 samples before you can actually do a standard error of the mean. Uh, if you don't have a large sample size, then you really can't do any statistics on it. So uh, that's the definition of genetic drift, um, and we need to look at some examples. So first off, um, like I said, it's going to be caused by random events in small populations. So by random events in small populations, um, let's look at a population of beads, because we're good at those, right? So um, let's say that the dominant is red and the recessive is uh, blue, so P is going to be the frequency of red and Q is going to be the frequency of blue. Um, and so I've got 5 out of 10 and 5 out of 10. So P is 0.5 and Q is 0.5 in that population. Um, and let's say I randomly choose beads out and I choose 5 random beads. Well, the 5 random beads that I chose were 4 red and 1 blue. And so if I go ahead and just double those numbers, uh, then what I would get is I would get 8 red and 2 blue, which if I go in do that again, you can see, you can first of all, you can see that my frequencies of my red and my blue alleles are different there. So let's go another generation, um, and I'm just going to select 5 red. Well, now my entire population is all red. And so what you're seeing there is you're just seeing a change in the frequency due to random probability. Um, and this is typically going to be associated with things like um, natural disasters. Um, if you're talking about uh, just randomly there's a fire and it burns off uh, part of an ecosystem and it just coincidentally happens that most of a phenotype was present in that part of the ecosystem when it burned, then you're going to have a skewed allele frequency in the subsequent generations from what you would expect in Hardy-Weinberg. So this is basically looking at a violation of Hardy-Weinberg's assumption of a large population size. So there's two specific cases um, that we need to talk about that have to do with genetic drift. The first one is going to be um, a population bottleneck, um, and that's exactly what it sounds like. So in a population bottleneck, what you have happening is uh, you have a large population of um, multiple phenotypes. In this case, we're still just going to have our blue phenotype and our red phenotype. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to sample just a few individuals from that population. So in this case, I'm going to draw out two. And coincidentally, the two that are closest to the top of the bottle are blue. So I'm going to have a population now that is all blue alleles. So I have a loss of certain genes certain alleles, um, and so the allele frequency is going to be different than in the original population. So let's look at an example. We're going to look at the example of sea otters. Um, so sea otters um, were hunted to what they thought was extinction in the uh, late 1700s uh, through the 1800s kind of during the gold rush. Uh, they basically hunted them to extinction, what they thought was extinction, and then um, they actually found some and they were like, wow, hey, these aren't extinct. That's awesome. So they suffered at least one bottleneck that we know about in the 1800s due to hunters that were involved in the fur trade. Um, and so scientists have gone through and they've actually sequenced the DNA from the sea otters and they've compared it to um, the DNA in sea otters pre uh, fur trade 
decimation, and so they've done that by going and actually obtaining samples of DNA from, from the pelts of the sea otters, and this is what they found. Um, that there's a loss of genotypic variation um, post fur trade, which is kind of what you would expect. So if you look at this graph, um, this is the LUT 453 allele frequency, which is a mitochondrial DNA allele, which is totally irrelevant to this. But on your y-axis, you have allele frequency in percent, and then you have um, the actual size of the allele. So it's just showing you the different possible alleles, the different variations that you see at this particular location in the population. And the dark gray bars are before the fur trade decimated the sea otter population, and the light gray bars are after um, fur trade. And you can see um, that the uh, light gray bar, or the dark gray bars before the fur trade, there were 20 alleles present in this population. And post fur trade, there's three alleles. So you're seeing a loss of genetic variation due to this population bottleneck. So the second thing that we need to talk about is the founder effect. So founder effect is kind of what we talked about already with some of the um, historical biogeography. So with founder effect, what you're going to have is you're going to have loss of genetic variation um, when an area is colonized by a very small number of individuals. Um, and so that's basically you're going to get that historical biogeography pattern that we always see. Um, but the allele frequencies on those islands are going to vary based on, um, on what actually colonizes the island. So let's look at an example. I've got my mainland, and I'm going to have three different phenotypes of beetles, and I drew them as all different types of beetles, um, just so it was clear to see the three phenotypes. We have to talk about these as if they all are the same species. So pretend they're just three different species of ladybugs. Um, so I'm going to have a purple ladybug, traditional ladybug, a creepy yellow and blue ladybug, all right? And so the mainland is going to be completely populated with my three different phenotypes of beetles. And I'm going to have three islands off the coast of the mainland. And it doesn't have to be islands. They could just be three different environments that are um, separated, geographically separated from the mainland. But islands are easy for us. So the first thing I'm going to have happen is I'm going to have this group right there go colonize that bottom island. So you'll notice that in that group I have um, just the yellow and the red ladybug. So I've got my red and my yellow, um, and I actually am going to bring over initially more yellow than red. So what do I expect to find as my allele frequency in my next generation and future generations? Just from my founding pioneer population, I would expect to see um, predominantly yellow beetles, but some red beetles, right? It's about a third red. In this uh, top island, I'm going to actually have one of each. And so I'm going to have red colonists, yellow colonists, and purple colonists. So in my pioneer population on the top island, um, once they uh, reproduce for several generations, what I would expect to see there is actually about the same frequencies that I had on the mainland. Because I just, you know, randomly had the same frequencies in my pioneer group. And in that center island, I'm just going to have just the two um, purple beetles. You have to have at least two, right? You got to reproduce. Um, so I'm going to start with two purple beetles. And as they reproduce, I'm going to end up with a population that's all purple. So clearly that island has lost um, the genetic variation of the other two phenotypes. So that's really all founder effect is. Um, and you see this a lot in island populations, but you also see it anytime you have a geographic barrier um, or anytime you have um, some large ecological disturbance in an area and then you have the species moving in, um, a small subset of the species moving in. The main thing you have to happen... Um, to have a founder effect is you have to have a small number of individuals colonizing an area that's not going to get a lot of gene flow, if any gene flow from the mainland or the primary group. That's it. I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions, come on by the classroom or give me an email.